Tonight, in this bumper episode, we'll be treated to laughs from Denise Scott, June Pearl, and Michael Nawi. Let's get things started with your host, Nazim Hussein. Hello! Good evening! It's gonna be a great night. Are you guys pumped? Real people, you know? Yeah, we've got, we got, we got an audience in here. All right, they're all working on cameras. Uh, they're all employed, paid to laugh at us, and uh, they're, they're doused in friggin' hand sanitizer. <laughs> Socially distanced. This place smells like cleaning alcohol. I'm, I'm drunk, I'm feeling drunk, and I'm Muslim. This is the first time I've been this intoxicated in my life. No, it's exciting. Good to be on stage with a microphone. Bloody hell. It's a Saturday disaster in Melbourne. We've got 8 p.m. bedtimes. Not much has changed for you, Denise, but no, it's um, the other states, they don't know what they're missing out on. This is, like, this is heaps of fun. We're loving it, okay? So if you're watching from another state, you're missing out. Uh, I'm, I, feel, I, am, I am sad about not being able to travel. That's, uh, that's one thing I do miss. Can't wait to travel again. You know, Queensland's laughing at us. Uh, I do miss their son, though. I went there last year. Actually, before I went there, I did some shows there. Um, someone actually sent me a link to a Gumtree ad and said, Nazim, why don't you stay here um, at this place? It was a, it was a legitimate ad on Gumtree uh, advertising a large, clean, luxury home in a suburb called Eight Mile Plains, $130 a night, uh, posted by a guy called Craig. <laughs> can bleep, you can bleep that out <laughs> afterwards if you want. Um, the body of the ad says, large, clean, luxury home. Our house is the cleanest and quietest house you can find in Brisbane. Professionally cleaned, large bedrooms, ADSL 2, blah, blah, blah. Minimum stay, two months. And I prefer like-minded people. Sorry, no backpackers, Indians and Muslims. <laughs> I know, I was horrified. Lumping us in the same boat as backpackers is disgusting. <laughs> Call to book an inspection on 04... <laughs> oh, 04 <laughs> And I called the number Guy picked up He said hello I said g'day mate I've just seen your ad online Place looks fantastic I want to stay there Three months I'll pay up front What are your bank details He goes don't you want to Don't you want to see the place mate I said I don't want to see the place What kind of a society do we live in If two strangers Over the internet Just can't trust each other mate <laughs> What are your bank details He got really excited He saw dollar signs He said alright You're going to pay up front I said yep He goes okay fa Fantastic No worries he goes, what's your name, mate? Got any questions? I said, my name is Muhammad. I'm a backpacker from India. And uh, I just got one question. Any of the bedrooms face Mecca? Anyway, hung up the phone. Waited five minutes, called him back again. G'day, mate, this is Mustafa. I'm a backpacker from India. He hung up the phone again. G'day, mate, this is Waleed. I'm a backpacker from India. He hung up again. G'day, mate, this is Abdurrahman. I'm a backpacker from Pakistan. And he hung up the phone again. I thought, what the hell is his problem? He said he doesn't like backpackers from India. I said I was from Pakistan. Well, maybe, maybe he recognises, like, pre-partition India. So I was like, all right, fair enough. <laughs> Called him back, like, 15 more times, all his backpacking Indian Muslims. Then my sister walks in, she's like, what the hell are you doing, Nazim? I said, what? It's Vodafone. i got unlimited calls. She's like, all right, fair enough. And she's like... <laughs> she's like, you idiot. You're a grown adult. Act your age, you idiot. I thought, fair enough. I thought, I've got, I've got to get this out of my sister. I'll go to sleep, sleep it off, wake up for the morning prayer, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'll pray, get out of my system. So I did that, woke up, prayed. And it worked. Didn't feel like calling the guy for about five minutes. Then at 5.05, <laughs> I called him. And he picked up, said, hello. I said, g'day, mate. Sorry about the early morning call. My name's Darren. I'm backpacking through Queensland on the way to Mumbai. Recently converted to Islam. My name is now Dawood. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. <laughs> Hung up the phone. Posted on my Facebook page. Within two hours, 2,000 people had called this guy, all of them as backpacking Indian Muslims. <laughs> I swear to God, someone actually paid for a Facebook ad. Someone paid for a sponsored post on Facebook looking for a backpacking Indian Muslim housemate and they used his name and number on the ad. <laughs> I, learned a very interesting, I learned a very interesting fact uh, the next day about Queensland. I don't know if you guys know, but they've actually got a newspaper in Queensland called the Courier Mail. I, know, I didn't even know they could read over there, but he was interviewed about this whole thing and he was quoted as saying, oh, it was Nazim, he said. I know him, I love him. He was funny in the jungle. I don't even know if he watched the show. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. We just thinks, that's where I'm from, the jungle. But um, <laughs> anyway, he said he, go, he said he said he wished his contact details had not been posted by Hussein after he'd received a couple of thousand telephone calls. Quote, that stuff's going to happen, he said. That's part of life. If I was racist, I would have been derogatory and used other language. As I told one of the guys, how can I be racist when I've employed people of those demographics to clean my house? <laughs> 
pretty, <laughs> pretty sound Queensland logic. He said he had hopefully found someone to move into the room. Quote, I have someone coming today to look at it, so it's all good. End quote, end article. I then posted that article on my Facebook page and someone commented with a screenshot of an appointment confirmation. This guy was about to meet a family of five hijab-wearing Muslim women, so... <laughs> Michael Nawi. Michael, thanks for doing this gig tonight. You're a dancer turned comedian, is that right? Uh, yeah, sort of. Um, or you're doing dancing still? S still doing dancing here and there. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm traffic control. So whenever you want to cross the road, just... <laughs> and then leave Slow it down. back. <laughs> yeah. So dancing, comedy, traffic management. Yeah. Which came first? Dancing? Yeah. So... I was a dancer uh, for Indigenous Hip Hop Projects. Well, so that's like break, like locking and popping? Yeah, I so wouldn't say break dancing. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's really, I'm pretty yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can do like, what, the, you can do the, can you do this? Can you do, yeah, you know, I can do that. You know? that's, that's probably the only thing I can do, half that's, decent. What, really? <laughs> yeah. Are you toured, right? Oh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say toured. It's more, they call it tour, so when we go away, yeah. so we, we fly to a community. Yeah, um, that's cool, that's a, that's stay a there touring. For a week. I'd, I'd give to it. Yeah. Just tell it sounds cool as well. Okay, yeah. Tour life, what happens on the road, all that sort of thing. Yeah. But on tour is where you met Kevin Cropinieri, is that right? Yeah. And yeah, so, he, so I met him in Palm Island. Really? Yeah, that's that's Queensland, right? Yeah. So he got you into comedy? It was weird, actually. Um, earlier that year, we had a, like artist camp. So that's when we learned the show um, for the year. Yeah. And then our director was like, you should try comedy. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> nah. Um, and then, yeah, we went on tour to Palm Island later that year yeah, for, for a festival. And Kev was emceeing the event. So that's where I first met him. Yeah. And then Deadly Funny come up. So I was like, oh, why not? So, <laughs> so, you just, just, you, so you just saw this competition, yeah, Deadly Funny, and you just... Yeah, I was just like, oh, we might as well. Yeah. We'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, can't be that hard, right? <laughs> um, and then, yeah, went there and it turns out Kev's hosting that as well. So he was emceeing and sort of doing the workshop stuff. What was it five minutes you have to do? Yeah, five minutes or something like so that. So five minutes sounds like, ah, oh, it's just five minutes. But how, how did you find your first five minutes? Oh, I glitched. Really? <laughs> yeah. In my head, I thought comedy was just like sort of talking. and like, But then you realize there's a structure to it. Yeah. You got to like connect it. And it's like, oh my God, I should have stayed with dancing. <laughs> so you realize this on stage? Yeah, in the, in the workshop, yeah. I realized. Okay. So I actually went there with nothing, no writing, yeah. like literally nothing. Yeah. Um, so with dancing, you just count in your head, sort of right. one to eight. But with comedy, it's, it's different. Wow. <laughs> it's a different art. So I spent the rest of that workshop trying to make something yeah. um, the last five minutes. And um, yeah, ended up winning that heat and wow. going straight to the grand final. You know, this is really exciting because I, I can sort of remember like w when I was five gigs in and I think I was just winging it. Yeah. Um, well... We're looking forward to your fifth or sixth gig yeah, ever. Still, yeah. I mean, are you excited? How are you feeling? Nervous. Are you nervous? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have any. Like, I didn't write anything again. Like, oh, well, so yeah. it's. <laughs> <laughs> How did you I was, learn from the first four gigs? <laughs> no, nah, I was in the car. Like, oh, what can I talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Michael Nowy. <laughs> All right, cut it out now. <laughs> equality. I'm here to talk about equality. Okay, consistent equality, I found it. I found the one place in the whole world where there's consistent equality. It's a busy shopping car park, <laughs> all right? Because it doesn't matter who you are, if you cut someone off in that car park, you're done. You could be the Pope driving a Ferrari, cut off Jesus in a Hyundai i30 and he's gonna drill you. It doesn't matter your race, your size, gender, color, it doesn't matter. People are crazy in car parks. It's actually insane. I remember I was walking to my car, me and my son were walking to the car, and this girl come flying around the corner and almost hit us. And she's looking at us like we're in the wrong. Like we're not in the wrong. There's a sign, there's literally a sign with a circle and a line through it and an arrow pointing right. <laughs> when a sign says don't turn right, guess what? Don't turn right. I literally hit the car. I punched the car out of anger. My son, he's five years old, he almost got hit. It was crazy. And she's looking at me like, oh, don't touch my car. What are you talking about? Follow the rules. The sign is a rule, not a challenge. We're not in Tokyo Drift, you're not DK. 
okay? But you're acting like a Donkey Kong all over the road, bro. And you know what she said to me? This, is her, this, was, this was her reasoning of why I got upset. She said, you're just bored. <laughs> I'm not bored. I didn't come to this car park on a Saturday in the afternoon to deal with people driving like maniacs in a car park. I come to get some dog food and a new toy and a new movie because my son's watched every movie we've got in the house because of this lockdown. <laughs> It's crazy. It's some, people are crazy on the road. It's not just in car parks, it's on the road. I'm a traffic controller. Like I stand there with the sign, slow and stop. People don't slow down. Again, it's a rule, not a challenge. <laughs> You're lucky we can't hit you with this sign. That's traffic control. We get shit thrown at us all the time. Like people literally throw stuff at you. It's crazy. Like, I don't know why when you see cones and a slow down road work ahead, all of a sudden you're in a rush. All of a sudden it goes from 60 to 80, not 60 to 40. There's a big truck about 100 metres down that says slow down. So quick message, slow the fuck down. Like we're just doing our job. Just like you, trying to get to your job. You wouldn't like it if you were at the printer and then someone comes past, pushes you out of the way and says, no, I need to fix it because there's a printing issue. <laughs> like it's not even making sense, I know that. <laughs> but it also doesn't make sense why you speed up when it says slow down. Like seriously, slow the fuck down. <laughs> All right, thanks guys, I'm out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, Jude Pearl. Dude, mate, I, I, the last time we gigged was, it felt like a, a million years ago. It was probably like in February, but it feels like a long time. <laughs> it was in St local. Kilda, right? Yeah, the local the Local laughs, laughs yes. local tap house. That's right, um, on Carlisle Street. Yeah, and like that's a pretty relaxed room. Fif 50 people in there, yeah. like, I mean, can you imagine doing a gig? to 50 people just oh. seems like heaven now. It'd be so nice. One day, yeah. 2022 is going to be off, <laughs> 2022. Off the it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. So you, you're you're one of those people that can um, you can tell jokes and you can do motor things, <laughs> sing and be funny with timing and everything at the same time. I uh, mean, it's tr it's true. I don't know how I do all of it at once, but yeah. I somehow managed. D did you like get trained as a pianist? Yes, I uh, I started off playing piano when I was like from the age of seven uh -huh. and then I just was singing singing all the time right. so uh, what you so you were performing from like seven well I was just learning, learning piano yeah I probably started performing when I was like 12 or 13 I eventually left school yeah and then I just started doing like gigs around melt like just at cafes and I was I had um, just before this interview started, we were talking about how confident we were when we were younger yeah, and yeah. stuff. Like, so I had so much, um, what's the word? Hustle. Right, I had yeah, a lot yeah. of, uh, really? I, I would go out and just give demos of my CDs what? to like restaurants. That's in New York. And then I just, yeah, was doing these gigs, like just playing covers and also, stuff. Also, did any of these restaurants uh, say, she's got it? Two of them actually, after really? giving out like about probably 300 demos, I reckon what? two responded. So, oh my God. So that just goes to show if you just... <laughs> Persevere, eventually. So no family connection to these restaurants? There was no nah, nepotism? it was just on my own, wow. just mad skills. Man, that's, that's great. <laughs> so you're performing as a musician for years, yep. and you're just like, this is not enough. I was like, I've mastered music, I've music. so <laughs> now I need to master <laughs> comedy, which I think I did like about <laughs> eight gigs in, I yeah, think. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure, so, sure, sure. Yeah. So what, how'd you, how'd you decide and, and what did you do then? Make it into comedy. Well, like I started writing songs, and I was trying to be like a serious like, pop artist. And um, <laughs> Sorry, I <shouldn't> laugh. <laughs> no, you should. You should definitely laugh. And uh, I was getting so much sort of um, unsolicited advice about like you know you should write songs that are more like this. So you know maybe you should try and be a little bit sexier or you know or just oh, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, and then yeah. I was like, or I could just do comedy, and then yeah. I could just write songs about um, you know meerkats and so, other crap. So then I, I just, I had, again, that confidence thing. I had that like, I could, I could do comedy and yeah. then I did Raw and I, and. Oh, so Raw was your first time doing a comedy yeah, song? Yeah, other than like theater stuff where, yeah. you know, I did like, but never stuff that I had written. Yeah. I feel like from my experience with Raw, it's like the first heat is like 
a very kind audience because or may, okay no, maybe it depends know, yeah. i think maybe the the gig that i did was like it must have just all been people so, that so you smashed it basically everyone laughed everyone was so nice and then my second gig was not like and i because oh, i did no. the first gig and i was like oh my god this is easy and then the second gig was like <laughs> right no you yeah right okay <laughs> well not many laughs yeah no, yeah that was like a really cool lesson about comedy as well as like and then seeing other comedians do like the same set yeah. in two different yeah, yeah. rooms and just noticing like hmm. I was like, oh there's yeah. like all these factors involved yeah, yeah. there's so many moving parts yeah so many ways to stuff it up yes oh they, yeah that's what's so great about it <laughs> well to, yeah. who are your comedy idols in australia one time when i was like did a gig with celia picola i okay. was a bit like oh, you're so good <laughs> and and also the, i think the first time i met um sammy J, I was oh, a bit yeah. like <laughs> Just like act normal and then I like trip over eight things and I'm like I didn't even walk anywhere how did that how did that happen yeah well mate we're just we're lucky to have you here tonight and are you how are you feeling yeah I just I'm a hundred percent fueled by excitement to be out of the house it'll be fine yeah, yeah. make some noise for Jude Pearl oh, thank you thanks very much um, I think I remember how to do this. It's been a while. Okay, that should be fine. Um, thanks so much for having me. This is, a, I feel like, one of the few things I can offer people during this time of lockdown is uh, just rip-offs of 80s power ballads. So I've uh, written an 80s power ballad just for you. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. What does it mean to be in love? I look in your eyes, but your eyes are closed. I ask you to open them, but you're asleep. How can you love me when you're asleep? Because our love is like a giraffe. That couldn't reach the leaves It's like an oasis Without any palm trees How love's like A watermelon with too many seeds We should have got seedless watermelon Last time we watched Sister Act 2 It's such a good movie We should watch it again My only problem with that film is Is I feel like there's a couple of tiny little plot holes Like how come Lauren Hill knows the dance at the end Even though she dropped out of the choir to the last minute Because our love is like an atlas from 1958 It's like a wearing pants That are made of heartbreak Our love is like a painting That you just can't hang straight No matter how hard you try You just can't make him straight Hang it straight This bed feels so much bigger now It's probably cause I bought a bigger bed <laughs> The old bed was doing a number on my back And it was falling apart Just like my heart
It's like a cannelloni filled with empty dreams. Our love is like the silhouette of a broken soda stream. Oh, I didn't even want to get a soda stream anyway. Said our love is like a meerkat trapped in a pillowcase. Mm, it's like a daffodil made of toxic water. Thank you. Thanks very much. See you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Denise Scott. Wow. Sitting here across from you is just, I feel like I'm, I'm getting funnier. You're getting funnier. I'm getting, I'm getting funnier because you're just a titan of comedy. I love that description. I don't even know what it means, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I'm trying to compliment. I'm really trying to You know to what? Actually, Nassim, I don't want to give you any gifts of comedy. I'm getting old. I've got to keep everything for well, myself. I'm a threat to you. You are. Anyone young is a threat. Yeah, we've got very different uh, shticks. Oh, I don't know. I do my Pakistan yeah. shtick. <laughs> it goes pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so co comedy, you've been doing this for a little bit. Yeah. Although, well, yeah, I have, but 30, 31 years. So I was 34 when I started, wow. do the math. What was, I mean, has much changed in comedy in Melbourne? Oh yeah, yeah. When I started, it was maybe some people thought it was a career, Yeah. but I certainly didn't. It was like, well, you're just gonna go out, you're yeah. gonna give it a burl, you're going to be with friends and have fun. Yeah. So you were just a young, a 30 year old woman. Well, yeah. Just, just decided to stand up out of, how did well, you get there? Well, I was 34, 34 and I'd been performing but and wanted to act, but had no work. And I, by then had two kids. It was me wanting to tell stories. Mm -hmm. I, I loved that notion yeah. of telling stories. I didn't know how, where else to do it. So you were just a stay-at-home mum at the time, two, two young kids, and you thought, I'm going to become a stand-up comedian. Yeah, and it was a nightmare because they, they, I looked after them full-time. I mean full-time. John was always out or often away. Yeah. And uh, so they'd be in a double pusher and I'd they had to come to gigs with me. Wow. That's, That's probably why they're disturbed now. <laughs> Come to think of it. <laughs> I mean, that's a massive move in 2020 for uh, a, a new mum of two young kids to just suddenly take up stand-up comedy, but let alone 30-something years In 1870 ago. when 1870. I was starting. Is this the first time you've been forced off stage for a, for a oh, few Oh, yeah. 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 It's uh, I, can't, I can't fathom yeah. what is happening. So this is the longest you've been without, without stage time? Oh yeah, definitely. Well, and it's it's it been a very uh, informative time because I've actually, to be honest, always kind of loathed comedy um, because I've always been really terrified of it. And uh, really, yeah, and it, it and that's dominated my thinking. And so I've always thought, oh, when this started, I thought, oh well. It's all off. Right? All right. There's and no I've to do it. really missed it oh. and really learnt how much I do love it. I love and I love the community because during this time I felt a lot of support mm. from other comedians and the, I found that wonderful and it's quite a, an amazing thing. So, so, now, so now you, wait, I didn't know you loathed comedy. What do you mean? No, I don't mean I loathe it. I, mm. I've never felt tr really that comfortable with the profession. Right. As in, you, like you get nervous? Shocking. And it's only got worse. Although. Really? Mm. So, so kids, hold on to your dreams. It yeah. just gets worse. So <laughs> <laughs> um, and what about, uh, do you know much about Jude Pearl? Um, Jude Pearl, I've seen perform a few times, and I think she is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I think she's a fantastic musician, vocalist. Like, what a dreamboat. I know. Imagine. Met, oh, 
Wouldn't you like, no, no. oh, if I could sing like that and play keyboard. <laughs> oh, oh. You're about to perform for the first time in a long time. Are you, are you excited? I'm excited. I'm a little bit nervous. Yeah? I'm a little bit nervous because, you know, <laughs> you just never know. I think it's a good thing to be nervous. Well, you'll be done in about 15 minutes and then you <laughs> go back to your lockdown house. With a gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Denise Scott! Oh, thank you. Well, here we are. I'm, um, I'm completely just, well, I'm fucked. Um, my uh, kids are both in their 30s now, you know, which means I can't talk about them anymore. Well, that's what their lawyer told me. <laughs> but no, they, they are. They're both in their 30s. They live overseas. My son and his girlfriend live in Nashville. They're musos, alt country, you know, which means, you know, they're poor. And, um, and my daughter lives in New York. She's a visual artist, which means, you know, she's very, very poor. But, but they're both, look, they're brilliant. They're brilliant artists. I'm very proud of them. People say, do I miss them? And look, put it this way. The last time my son left to go back to America and walk through those departure doors at the airport and they closed, I may or may not have fallen to the ground and screamed, come back, mummy's got nothing left to live for. <laughs> so of course, seriously, of course I miss them. And especially now during these lockdown times. But if there's one thing I've learned as a parent, it's this, it doesn't matter where in the world your kids are. It doesn't matter what in the world is going on. It doesn't matter how old they are. They will always need your unconditional money. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in my mid-60s now, and uh, so all the literature tells you you've got to fight the ageing process. You don't give in to it. You, you, you Fight it, you stay on top of it. But I've got to be honest and tell you that every part of my being is just screaming, I can't be fucked doing anything. <laughs> and I know they didn't want language, but it's what's there. You know, I truly, it's seriously, I'm just speaking truth. All I want to do is lie in bed and drink. <laughs> and yes, it is hard to lie in bed and drink at the same time. So thank God for bendy straws. <laughs> in fact, the only thing that gets me to sit up these days is my acid reflux. <laughs> but it doesn't mean, you know, being in your 60s, it doesn't mean life still can't be an adventure. Like, for instance, last year, I went on Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> um, to, <laughs> Bullshit. You were in celebrity whatever it is jungle. No wonder you whooped. We're both losers. But, um, but no, I went on Dancing I, last year. I went on Dancing with the Stars, and which is a TV show where celebrities get teamed up with a professional dancer and you do ballroom dancing and there's three judges and each week they give you a score out of ten. And um, look, I found it hellish. Absolute hell, I won't lie. But that third week I gave it everything I had and I managed to score a nine in total. Uh, Craig, the nasty judge, gave me a one and called me a hunchback. But you get over it. Um, Shana, the lovely judge, literally said, Denise, wow. Wow. <laughs> Denise, girlfriend, wow. She's not American, but I don't know what the accent is. But anyway, wow, girlfriend, you are an inspiration. You are living your best life. Which I think we all know means you're dancing shit. And if I were you, I'd kill myself. <sighs> and look, speaking of suicidal thoughts, I had to chair a dressing room during that series with Michelle Bridges. Mm -hmm. Now, Michelle is a wonderful person, but you know who she is. She's the fitness guru, the most beautiful body on the planet. I had to get undressed <laughs> in the same room as Michelle. I, I mean, and when you, I, I had to nude up. As I said to Michelle, do you mind if we turn the lights off? <laughs> and Michelle had to get undressed, so we're nude. 
I mean, Michelle, no, it's, she's got a G-string on. She had a little costume, a little mini, little mini dress, strapless thing. She asked me to zip her up. Was it cruel of me to pretend I couldn't do it? Oh, jeez. Jeez, Michelle. What'd you have for dinner, you fatso? Anyway. So uh, that was that. Oh, oh, well, and of course, these days during lockdown, you keep your mind active. We've, we've had to get around new technologies like Zooming. And uh, some of my friends have actually asked me for Zoom advice. And uh, I, look, the only tip I can offer, I don't know whether this will help anyone else, but when I'm at the computer and, and I'm trying to Zoom, something goes wrong, what I do is simply turn my head to the left and scream, John! <laughs> and um, it's usually fixed in a few minutes. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, the other thing I've done during lockdown, uh, I don't know if this has happened to you, but you find yourself just staring at things you've never looked at in your house before. Like, seriously, I came across this book. I don't know who bought it. I don't know when it was bought. But this is seriously a book called Wabinda. Can you see that if I do that? Um, it was written in 1970 and it's about a vet in the outback who is helped by his daughter, his 18-year-old daughter, Tiggy. And um, we've got a picture of Tiggy here. Can you see 18-year-old Tiggy? Um, there, it's 1970, that's Tiggy. Uh, she, uh, what does it, she excels in sport, wears modern clothes and likes to keep herself suntanned. And I thought, why would she do that? Why would she like to wear clothes and keep, keep herself suntanned? That wasn't Instagram then. Was she just doing that for fun? It's crazy. Um, now, also, I must say, this is how we all looked back in 1970. Um, you know, we, we because strong and uh, sexy and about 20 years older than we were. Uh, the sun did terrible damage back then. But seriously, um, we didn't have, of course, computers back then. We didn't have social media. Uh, and if you were Catholic... Um, which I can see Tiggy was. <laughs> if you were Catholic, you see, you couldn't use birth control. It was a sin. Masturbation was a sin. So the way us Catholic girls relieved our sexual tension was to have races across rivers whilst carrying a wet lamb. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Uh, anyway, that's just... It took us back on a nostalgia trip. Uh, so, just before lockdown happened, uh, so back in February, the first lockdown, in February, John, uh, my partner of 40 years, let's face it, um, just out of the blue announced, guess what, Scotty, I'm going to have a colonoscopy tomorrow. <laughs> I know, talk about attention-seeking. <laughs> what a nightmare, what a carry-on it was. Anyway, he'd done the bowel cancer screening kit, you know, so it was a part of that reaction. To, so the good, so he's got to go off, have a colonoscopy. Before you have a colonoscopy, you've got to take a thing called pico prep, which is to evacuate your bowels. <laughs> That's what it says on the side of the box. <laughs> evacuate your bowels. Now, is it only me, but I'm picturing a little cartoon animated doctor looking up John's asshole, going, prepare to evacuate, prepare to evacuate. And all the little t turds, you know, popping on their life vests, getting ready to whiz down the slide. Which is exactly how the poo comes out after you've taken Pico Prep. Which is why it's suggested that after taking it, you stay near a toilet. Which is why when John, after taking the Pico Prep, said to me, Scotty, I'm going to work, specifically, he was going to drive 45 minutes down the freeway to a primary school where he was running a stilt walking workshop. I said, John, you cannot do that. He said, why? I said, because you've taken stuff to evacuate your bowels. <laughs> and he, in his typical, I'm a man, I know better than everyone, even the manufacturers of Pico Prep, <laughs> said to me, Scotty, I'll be fine. 
At which point I yelled at him, well, John, I hope you shit your pants. (laughs) It'll be a good lesson in humility for you. I said, and John said to me, I, I could have cancer, and that's all you've got to say? I hope you shit your pants, John? Well, you are atrocious. And I said, and you are an idiot. <laughs> and then we were fine. That's what being together 40 years, you know. So John had, look, I'll have to say, no kids. He went, he did the workshop, didn't shit his pants. Gee, he ran down our hallway, though, when he got home, I can tell you. <laughs> And, uh, and he had the colonoscopy all fine. Except, seriously, he said, do you want to see the photos of his colon? Like, why the... F- oh. I said, I, well, no, but I'd love one for my wallet in case the girls at book club want to have a look. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave you with it because... You know, I, having a lockdown birthday, not... I, look, who cares? It was my 65th. I didn't want a present from John. Of course not. I don't care. He did. He gave me a book, because I love reading. And he gave me a book called The Luminaries, which is a, a fabulous... Not, like, it's 850 pages thick. It's a fat novel. And I opened up this gift, and I said, Oh, John, you've given me this. And he said, well, yeah, I heard someone raving about it. And I said, well, gee, John, I think that someone might have been me because I've been lying beside you in bed for the last six months reading it. (laughs) Okay, that's, that's me. That's angry me lockdown. Thank you very much. Well, that's the end of the show. Hope you had a good time. Give it up one more time for Michael Nowy, Jude Pearl, and Denise Scott. Look after yourselves. Good night. Tune in next time when we'll be joined by M. Ruciano and Alex Ward.